Hi everyone! So in this video I'm going to be showing you guys a top grade sample essay for the GCSE English Literature AQA Paper 2 Modern Texts and Poetry. And specifically we are going to be looking at the novel Lord of the Flies. So I've actually taken this question from the 2017 past paper. So you can actually see it's in the second question in the section on Lord of the Flies. Okay, so uh, we are looking at a real past paper question here. And so I'm pretty sure that you are all aware of the scheme of assessment. And if you are not, I'll be providing you the link to that document um, in the description box so you can actually refer to that. But um, I think there are plenty of videos out there just kind of walking you guys through the specifics of the scheme of assessment, plenty of very good videos. Um, and so instead, what I'm going to do in this video is to actually show you guys what an actual top grade essay looks like and to also walk you guys through the specific components that we'll have to include in a top grade essay so that you know just what exactly it is that you should be including and what you should be modeling your efforts on for your own essays, okay? So we're just gonna start. So let's just begin by very quickly looking at the question. The question gives us a quote taken from the very end of the novel, Ralph wept for the end of innocence, the darkness of man's heart. And so this is the part where uh, the naval officer actually discovers the boys and Ralph realizes by that point just how far they've descended from goodness and innocence to evil and barbarism. And so this question then asks, what does William Golding have to say about human nature in Lord of the Flies? And we're asked to write about how the boys behave on the island and how Golding uses the boys' behavior to explore ideas about human nature. In terms of what we're asked to look at for the scope of our essay, notice that the question is kind of nudging us towards looking at the boys as a whole. So I think this is the example's way of suggesting that we shouldn't only be looking at one character, one boy or uh, two boys. We shouldn't only be looking at Ralph or Piggy or Jack, or what have you, um, but we should be looking at the boys as a whole, right? And of course, we're asked to look at how Golding uses the boys' behavior. So this idea of how Golding uses, it actually implies the methods that Golding uses to show us the thematic ideas about human nature. So we're going to walk through this essay um, paragraph by paragraph. So this essay begins by saying, as a grammar school teacher and a World War II naval officer, William Golding wrote Lord of the Flies with sharp, unique insight into human nature. So right off the bat, this student has very savvily chosen to show us that she is aware of the author's background. So, so it's not necessary to include lots of biographical details um, in our essays, but it's certainly good to show you of your awareness of it at the start of the essay, just to also use it to frame the rest of your argument. And also the student has very intelligently chosen to show the examiner that she is aware of exactly what the question is asking her for, right? Human nature. And she's saying, hey, you know, I know what you're asking me for. You're asking me to look at human nature and I'm just gonna write that to show my awareness right off the bat. She follows on by saying, set against the catastrophic backdrop of World War II with figures like Hitler and Stalin showing man's capacity for extreme evil through genocide, pogroms and authoritarian rule. Lord of the Flies is a cautionary allegory that sheds light on the fine line between civilized and barbaric tendencies in human nature. So nicely showing us the historical context and how the novel is related to that context. She goes on to say, in the novel, Golding explores such ideas as whether man is born good or evil, the necessity of law and order as a check on human behavior and the tribal instincts that threaten social structures. So she's here showing us that she knows what those ideas about human nature are, right? She's saying these are the ideas that Golding explores about human nature in the book. And she's breaking it down into three sections and implicitly telling us these are the three ideas that she'll be exploring. And indeed, she actually then goes on to say, well, in this essay, I will analyze the ways in which Golding explores these ideas through his portrayal of the boy's behavior. So very clearly laid out, um, from the context to the thesis, 
and to the signpost, right? So this is very clear as an introduction. So now let's move on to the first main body paragraph. So it starts by saying, throughout Lord of the Flies, the ability to host an assembly is a barometer for the degree of civility on the island. Clearly, we see from the topic sentence that the student is going to be talking about a key component in any civilized society. And in the Lord of the Flies, the assembly is the key motif for that. As long as a functioning assembly can still be held, order prevails among the boys. But as chaos gradually descends, chanting rituals supplant democratic assemblies for all hell to break loose. So this is a really good follow-on sentence because she's showing us that she's aware of how the assembly as a motif develops throughout the entire novel. Because we know that the assemblies are held at the start of the novel, but then gradually as chaos takes hold of the island, there are no longer any assemblies because Ralph is no longer able to host them because the boys are no longer willing to partake in them. But instead we see that chanting rituals replace assemblies as representative platform for the boys. And then she says, at the start, Ralph rejoices in the absence of grown-ups. But once he takes on the de facto grown-up role as chief of the boys, he realizes the importance of a mature authority figure in maintaining order. As Ralph reflects on the importance of an assembly, the anaphoric structure of his opening words mimics the rhetorical cadence of politicians and suggests his desire to exude authoritativeness and command attention. As when he declares that we need an assembly not for fun, not for laughing and falling off the log, not for making jokes, not for these things, but to put things straight. Okay, so just going to pause here. So anaphoric structure, that is an example of a syntactical device, right? Anaphora. So we know anaphora is the repetition of the same word or phrase at the start of consecutive sentences. So clearly we see the example of anaphora here, not for fun, not for laughing, not for making jokes, not for these things, right? And so this student is here showing us that she is engaging with the author's methods, with the author's um, literary choices, and also giving us subject terminology, right? So she's definitely scores here with the subject terminology and also with the right quotation, okay? And also with the analysis here, which is super important. There's an aphra in what Ralph says, but why does Golding have him use an aphra? Well, it's because he wants to come across mature, and authoritative, right? Uh, and actually, it also kind of reminds us of politicians, right? The way they speak. Often there is anaphora in, in politicians' speeches. And then following on, she says, unfortunately, the boys are shown to respond with flippant impatience and burgeoning discontent, which is revealed through the string of verbs that Golding uses to describe their reactions, giggling, murmuring, sniggering, shouting, etc. So again, we see another language device here, verbs, the use of verbs. And so what's the point? Well, the point to bringing in all these verbs is to show these nascent signs of disobedience foreshadow the mass dissent and social disintegration, which will soon manifest on the island. And again, foreshadow, it's another subject terminology here, showing us that, ah, you know, the disobedience at the start may seem harmless, but actually they forebode something a lot darker, which we will see towards the end of the novel, because the disobedience then becomes violence and murder, right? And the boy's reluctance to abide by set rules is especially apparent when an unnamed boy interrupts Ralph's speech with the objection that there are too many things they need to care about for the sake of maintaining order. This pessimistic state of development reflects Golding's idea that rules and laws are necessary components in any society because they carry the crucial function of regulating behavior, enforcing discipline, and keeping humanity's baser instincts in check. So this final sentence here doubles as an overall analysis of this assembly motif and kind of brings us a step further in understanding this key idea, right, which is that it's not just about the assembly that Golding is making a point of. Golding is saying not just the assembly, but in any society, there is a need to abide by rules and law. There is a need for us to actually respect 
the social structures that are in place. And the assembly is, of course, one example of that. If we take a look at this paragraph, you notice that it's a very complete paragraph and that there is the topic sentences, and then there's lots of technical terms, the right amount of technical terms matched with their corresponding quotations and examples, and also obviously analysis that shows us the relationship between devices and also um, examples. Okay, so now we move on to the second main body paragraph. And so the second main body paragraph would naturally then be a discussion of the second key idea. As Jack gradually grows in clout over the boys with his promises of meat and hunting, Ralph's legitimacy is challenged and his power eclipsed. But this tip in power dynamics would not have happened without the boys enabling behavior as they give in to their tribal primitive instincts and turn their back on discipline and decency. Okay, so we know that then this paragraph is going to be discussing and looking at how human nature is tribal and primitive at its core. And when given the right circumstances and temptations, we are most likely to turn our back on discipline and decency, which are things that require more conscious effort. So this is, again, a very clear introduction to this idea of the paragraph. Golding shows through the boys' shift in allegiance the human tendency to prefer short-term gratification, often at the expense of doing the right thing, following on with uh, an explanation. This means that demagogues who exploit popular sentiments like Jack can easily gain power with an immature, misinformed electorate like the young boys. An apt historical parallel for this phenomenon is Hitler and the Third Reich's rise to power in the 1930s as the Nazi party gained popular support by appealing to the darker emotions of human psychology and fanning popular hatred towards scapegoats like the Jews. So you see the student here has brought in a historical parallel, therefore showing her awareness of context and linking that to the text in question. And so this is a good example of being able to bring in contextual knowledge while discussing your idea. For most of the novel, though, the boys, despite their recusant behavior, are unwilling to openly denounce Ralph's authority. When Jack challenges Ralph's leadership by asking for whoever wants Ralph not to be chief to put their hands up, he is met with deadly silence. Okay, so we see some quotation here. What's the point to bringing in these examples? Let's find out. Which Golding reinforces with the metonymy, okay, metonymy of a silence which continued, breathless and heavy and full of shame. Okay, so fantastic. We see another use of subject terminology here, this time metonymy, which is the use of a reference to stand in for its bigger related idea. It is, of course, the boys who are burdened with shame, and so they hide behind the silence much like how Golding implicitly uses the boys' reaction, silence, as a stand-in for the boys themselves. So this is the analysis then of the use of metonymy and how the metonymy reinforces and advances that idea of how there is a certain kind of shame that comes with giving in to our tribal primitive instincts, right? But at this point, the student wants to say that the boys are still aware of their conscience, right? And that is why they feel ashamed. And that is why they're so silent here. However, they eventually give in to their animalistic desires for meat and eventually defect to Jack's camp. And so we see a transition here. The ignominious betrayal is symbolically presented in chapter nine, symbolically here, another terminology, when they were laughing, singing, lying, squatting, or standing on the grass, holding food in their hands with greasy faces, the meat eating almost done with Jack painted and garlanded like an idol. Okay, we see the change here. The, the student is, is here bringing in a, actually a contrast between the boys before they were completely converted to the animalistic side to after they, they've chosen to give in to their more animalistic instincts. And so indeed, Jack loads over his triumph with the question, who joined my tribe? The word tribe signaling the primitive nature of a society compared to Ralph's more civilized construct. So I'm sorry, this is uh, um, this should be in the um, lighter yellow. Yeah, but the word tribe here, the, the fact that the student is actually engaging with diction here and looking at how this diction specifically distinguishes Jack and Ralph's 
camps is a good point here. The boys' sense of shame returns when they see Piggy and Ralph approach, which is echoed in the repeated reference to silence repetition here. When they noticed Piggy and Ralph and fell silent one by one till only the boy next to Jack was talking, then the silence intruded even here. So really good of the student to notice that there's the use of the word silence in both moments, right? But in this case, she says, while the earlier silence presages cowardice of the heart, the silence in this moment marks the full conversion from good to evil. So she's pointing out that the, the word silence in this later moment carries a graver connotation. And the connotation here is no longer just shame, but a full-blown kind of conversion, a silence that signals tacit agreement with Jack's way of doing things. And obviously that's incredibly pessimistic. Okay, so now we move on to the third and final main body paragraph in this essay. Central to Golding's view of human nature is the notion that we are born evil and therefore capable of extreme cruelty and selfishness. So this is the third idea, and I think it's really smart of the student to choose to use this specific idea and choose to place this specific idea as the final idea, because this is more of an all-encompassing idea, because it really does encapsulate Golding's total view of human nature, right, which is that regardless of all of our civilized efforts, regardless of education, we are actually fundamentally born evil. And therefore, across the board, we are all capable of extreme cruelty and selfishness. And it doesn't really matter what sort of facade or veneer we put on. And so this is a really good sort of encapsulating idea to place at the end as a kind of nice wrap up. At the start of the novel, the boys show the potential for malevolence with the bullying sneers at Piggy's nickname and physique. But... The full extent of their brutality is only revealed towards the end when they collectively murder Simon in a mad, bloodthirsty frenzy and when Roger kills Piggy by striking the latter with a boulder. So these are also specific examples and that's also really good to show how the boys kind of descend from you know their original kind of more civilised state to, to finally revealing their true violent colours. The tribe's ritualistic chant kill the beast, cut his throat, spill his blood, serve as an ironic refrain. Okay, so irony and refrain, subject terminology, throughout chapter nine, because the boys are so swept up by tribalistic hysteria and their blind desire to inflict pain, they don't realize the beast they're killing is the least harmful character on the island. So this is actually the uh, uh, explanation for why it's ironic. It's ironic because the boys think that they're killing the beast, but actually they're killing the least beastly character, the least beastly boy, who's quite Simon. And at that point, he was in fact making his way back to the group to inform everyone of the truth about the beast. Namely, that it does not exist materially as either the dead parachuter or a ghost, but within each of the boys. Okay, so this is, this is good as all part of the uh, explanation for the tragic irony of, of, the, of their chant. Specifically, Golding's use of metonymy and synecdoche in portraying Simon's slaughter sharpens the graphic intensity of the boy's violence. So metonymy and synecdoche, again, subject terminology. So we've explained metonymy, synecdoche is related, which is using a part of something to stand in for its whole. Uh, if you want a more detailed explanation of the difference between metonymy and synecdoche, you can check out the blog post that I'll link to in the description box below. But anyway, here, the student then goes on to bring an example. As when, at once the crowd surged after it, poured down the rock, leapt onto the beast, screamed, struck, bit, tore. There were no words and no movements but the tearing of teeth and claws. Okay, so very graphic, very violent here. And then she goes on to analyze, well, just what the point of the metonymy and synecdoche is. So the boys are collectivized here as the crowd and reduced to their bodily parts of teeth and claws. So this, the boys are collectivized here as the crowd, is the example of metonymy. Actually, I'll use, maybe here I'll use different colors um, just to make it clearer. Yeah, so metonymy is the crowd standing in for the boys. Which color should I use? Hmm. Okay, it's this. Persimmon. 
as a person or blood orange anyway <laughs> and then reduced to their bodily parts of teeth and claws that's the uh, synecdoche because the teeth and claws the boys body parts but standing but here standing in for the boys right so what's the point well it suggests that by the stage they have completely regressed from humanity to bestiality right so there you go that's the analysis here Meanwhile, Simon is dehumanized through the lens of the boys as a mere it. You notice here, the crowd surged after it. The it here actually refers to Simon, which of course is odd because it is a pronoun for, it's supposed to be a pronoun for inanimate objects, but of course Simon is a human. And the scene is devoid of all human agency with the absence of words or movements, right? So she's engaging with the negatives here, no words and no movements. And so ultimately then, man in its natural essence is a compendium of animalistic urges and actions. And whether we transcend beyond the animal depends entirely on our conscious decision to align ourselves with our acquired humanness. So nicely wrapping up this idea of just how easily it is for the boys and by extension for humanity, for human beings to regress to our native primitive animalistic selves. So now let's wrap up by looking at the conclusion. To conclude, William Golding explores various facets of human nature in Lord of the Flies, primarily through the boys' interaction with each other, the gradual descent into tribalism and the island's social fragmentation. So this is a summary sentence. This is a summarizing sentence of the thesis and the ideas that we've explored in this essay. From establishing order on the island to succumbing to their baser instincts, the boys are a reflection of sundry civilizations and societies throughout history. As we see empires and governments begin their rule with optimistic visions for the future, only to always suffer defeat at the hands of man's darker traits. So this is moving from summary to significance. And you see the student conveys the significance of the topic by recontextualizing the novel, right? She's putting the novel back in the historical circumstances in which Golding wrote this book and therefore telling us, well, this is why Lord of the Flies is such a classic. It's because it's telling us something really timeless and universal and important about the human condition, which applies for all time. And so the significance here is also very important. And then finally, she wraps up by saying, what defeats us, Golding seems, to suggest isn't so much an external beast or a minatory specter, but our inherent weaknesses as flawed human beings. So very nicely wrapping up with a touch of personal reflection here as well. Okay, so this is basically then a full top grade English lit sample essay on a prose text. And so you notice that um, it's just those same components, you know, that that um, you'll be able to find in the scheme of assessment. Um, and it's really, as you as you can tell, it's it's very structured. But at the same time, it doesn't really strike us as being very formulaic when you're reading it, right? It still has its organic flow. The paragraphs link from one to another, and there is definitely a discernible rationale behind why the student has chosen to lay out her ideas in this way and obviously also with very complete introduction and conclusion paragraphs so i hope this is helpful if you want a copy of the sample essay you can just sign up for my newsletter which i'll link to in the description box below and i'll be sending that to you once you sign up okay and if there are any other texts or essay questions that you'd like me to cover please do leave me a comment below so that I can try my best to cover them in, in the upcoming videos, okay? Please also do make sure to hit the thumbs up button and also subscribe. I'd massively appreciate it. So I'll see you guys in the next video.